<laughs> After Jesus died, they put Jesus in a tomb. And wrapped him with some white paper. They put a big stone around it and placed guards in front of the tomb to let nobody go in. He was just waiting for the three days. He's probably drinking soda while eating hot Cheetos. <laughs> he would probably play games like Candyland and then have a party by himself. <laughs> the okay. Easter Bunny was hiding behind a tree. <laughs> he probably went out there and just, just throw eggs everywhere. And then he's going to say, there's one money egg, so you better find it. You don't get some money. Three days later, there was a big earthquake. <laughs> I think we should go away somewhere safe. It's like, I'm getting out of here. The earth is shaking, run for your lives. <laughs> and the guards ran off because they got scared. And then on Sunday, Mary and some of her friends came with some spices. But when they got there, the tomb was empty. His clothes only was there. Then an angel came and said, Don't be afraid. Jesus has risen from the dead. Go tell the go tell everyone. Go tell the good news. Mary and her friends went and told the disciples. She said, Jesus has risen from the dead. Guys, guys, Jesus has risen from the dead. And the disciples didn't believe them. No! That couldn't happen. Jesus can't raise from the dead. Uh, I don't believe it until I see it. But all of a sudden, Jesus, Jesus just came, just was there. I am Jesus. I am the, I'm the, I am the Son of the Lord God, and I am Jesus, your friend. And then the disciples said, Jesus, it's you. Yay! Jesus is alive! Totes cool. Jesus, before he left to heaven, he said, I have done what I have came to done. Do. And then he wrote, risen, and he was going up to heaven. His disciples were crowded around him. The disciples said, holy guacamole. I can't believe Jesus really flew. That's awesome. Now what? Let's go tell the news. Well, good morning. Glad you guys are here this morning to join us for this special occasion as we celebrate the day of our risen Savior, Jesus. If this, if this is the first time you're joining us, we're glad you guys are here. And I want to give you the opportunity to uh, reach out and connect with you and invite you to email me at matt at stonebridgemarietta.org. And you can just send a one-line email Hey, I'm new to Stonebridge, and I'll look forward to connecting with you and would love to share more with you about our church. On Sundays, it is our desire every Sunday that all of us, from the students, the children, to the adults, that all of us would have the opportunity to connect with the Lord and that we would also be able to connect together as a body. And so we're glad you guys are here this morning. Again, we want to thank you guys for continually giving to us through this time and on the screen. Um, how you can continue to give uh, your offering to us, to our church. And we're so thankful that we have a church that just has been giving to us through this whole time. So as we continue in worship, let's go ahead and spend a couple minutes as we open the service in prayer. Jesus, we're so thankful for this weekend, for what it means to us that we see your deep love for us on the cross. And we get to experience and see your power as you rose from the dead, your victory over death. We love you. We love this day that we get to celebrate who you are. We get to celebrate your goodness. We get to celebrate your love for us pray all these things in your name. Amen. After the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week,
Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are here looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Let's pray together as we go into worship. Jesus, our desire is to lift you high and to, to meet with you during this time. But we want to give you our thanks. We want to give you our hearts today. We want to give you our minds and our bodies. We're so thankful for what you've done for us. That you've made a way for us to enter into your presence. To know the Father. So Holy Spirit, we invite you now as we worship. To come and be with us. To dwell in us. To fill us up. To speak and to move in our homes. In our families and in the city. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. And hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, fear, where is 
your power, the mighty King of kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed, eternal life is ours, oh praise his name forever, hallelujah, Christ from the grave hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave and all throughout eternity our song will be the same hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave you were beginning the one with God the Lord most high your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name Jesus Christ, my King, what a beautiful name it is, nothing can stand against, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are ringing, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no
rest my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid Him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all of
I'm Katie, and I'm the children's ministry director here at Stonebridge Church. Um, and I think probably today we have lots of families worshiping together, which is great. Um, and so I wanted to take just a minute and talk to you, our Pathfinder kids, who are worshiping at home with your families this morning. Um, so happy Easter. I hope you guys are having a wonderful Easter full of um, joy and worship and Easter baskets and candy and bunny ears and all of the things that Easter brings. Um, and I know you guys know this, but we celebrate Easter because we're remembering the first Easter, remembering the work that Jesus did on the first Easter morning when he rose from the grave after being dead for three days and he beat sin and death. He won over sin and death so that we could be in relationship with God and so that when we die, we can go and be with God forever be with him. Um, and so that's what we celebrate on Easter morning, and that's a huge reason to celebrate. But this Easter, I also want to remind you that we don't have to wait until the end of our lives to get to experience the goodness and the victory that Jesus brings. When we choose to trust Jesus and we believe in what he did for us on the cross in coming to die for us, we get to enter into a relationship with him now. We get to walk through each day with the Son of God the son of a God who loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us on the cross so that we could be in relationship with him. We get to be in relationship with a God who's working for our good and who wants goodness and victory for us in our lives. So this Easter, we want to celebrate both. We want to celebrate that one day we get to be in heaven with God, that we don't have to be afraid of death any longer, that we get to live with him forever and for eternity. And we also want to experience and celebrate Jesus's victory in our lives and in our hearts today. So this Easter morning, I want you to think about your life, and I want you to think about if there's an area in your life today where you need Jesus to win, where you need him to beat sin. Maybe there's something that's making you feel worried or scared, and you need Jesus to bring you his peace. Maybe you're angry at someone, or there's a situation, something that happened that makes you feel angry, and you need Jesus to win in your heart with his love. Maybe you or someone you love is sick or you have a relationship that's struggling and you need Jesus to bring healing in that place. He wants to do those things. He wants to work in your heart and he wants to, to bring goodness into your life. So let's, um, as Mr. Bo comes up and sings um, our next song, I want you to spend some time in prayer and spend some time reflecting with the Lord on that. Let's thank him for the huge work that he did on Easter and for... Um, making it so that we could be in a relationship with God and that we could spend eternity in heaven with him. And then if there's an area in your life where you need Jesus to win today, submit that to him. Say, Jesus, I trust you. I believe in what you did for me. I believe in your love for me. And I want to trust you with this thing or this person or this thing that has me worried, this situation. And then ask him for help. Ask him to win. Um, ask him to replace whatever it is, your worry, your anger, your sadness, with peace and with his joy um, because he loves you so much. So let's celebrate those things um, and spend some time thanking him for that this Easter morning.
His reign is everlasting While kingdoms rise and fall No one can stand against Him He is the Lord of all His reign is everlasting While kingdoms rise and fall No one can stand against Him He is the Lord of all His reign is everlasting And we're glad you guys are joining us uh, this morning. Uh, if you've got a Bible, uh, you can turn to John 20. We're going to dip out of Revelation for one week before we get started uh, with the Scripture. Thanks to Emily Smith for putting uh, all these uh, flowers together, the floral arrangement. If you know her, please let her know how appreciative you are. And also, uh, thanks to all of y'all that participated in that family challenge this week, it was great to see all this, the submissions. People said when I got on Instagram like two weeks ago that that was a sign of the apocalypse. I think a better one is Marty Tanner in a TikTok video. I'm not sure I ever thought I would see that. So that may be an indicator that the end is near. So you want to pay attention this morning. So we're going to look at um, two encounters that Jesus has uh, post-resurrection, one on Easter Sunday morning and then one a week later. These are both found in John 20, so I'm going to read both of them together, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about them. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that's John, and she said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Jump over to verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, so she's come back at this point. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, Mary said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord, and she told them that he'd said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Skip down to verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But Thomas said, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands... And put my finger where the, where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. 
Then Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So there's not a lot that we know about either Mary Magdalene or Thomas. They're both mentioned just a couple of times uh, in, in the Gospels. But uh, we don't have enough to, to paint a picture, but I think we can draw a sketch of each one of them. Uh, Mary Magdalene, the most significant thing in her life was she had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus. That's not recorded in the Gospels. We don't know the story. It's just recorded in Luke 8 that it actually happened. So if you think about a demon as this being whose sole job assignment is to wreak havoc, to steal and kill and destroy, and now imagine that you are, you're, you're subject to the, the influence or the control of seven of those. And then Jesus comes in with a word, he sets you free. That's a life-changing encounter. She went from enslaved to free in a moment. And what we see from, from Mary Magdalene is then she devotes herself to following Jesus. She's a part of this group of women that are following Jesus around, like physically, literally following him around for at least a short period of time. Uh, she was one of several women who supported Jesus in the 12 out of her own pocket. Uh, She was one of a small group of women who were there at the crucifixion. They didn't leave. They didn't run away. They were there until after Jesus was not just uh, died, but also after he was buried. She saw where he was, what tomb he was placed in. And then we see she's first one on the scene on Easter Sunday morning. That's the first time that anybody could have gotten to the tomb uh, without violating the Sabbath law. So when I think about Mary Magdalene, I think of her as passionate, I feel like emotional maybe has a negative connotation. I see her as passionate and devoted to Jesus. Thomas, again, we don't, he, he only shows up a couple of times, and it's uh, only in John's gospel. Uh, he's one of the 12, so he's part of this select group. Jesus picked him, handpicked him. Out of all the people who were following him, Thomas was one of the 12 that Jesus uh, chose to, to live with him during his three years of public ministry. Uh, he has the... the the moniker Doubting Thomas because of the scene that we just read in John 20. I, I don't know if that's really fair to him. A couple of other times that we see him in John, I don't necessarily sense doubt. I actually think he's very dedicated to Jesus, I, I, but I think he's also a practical thinker. I think he maybe holds both of those things in common. If we want to see Mary as someone who's really led by her passion and her devotion, I see Thomas maybe as someone who's just as committed and just as loyal, but maybe he's led a bit more kind of practically and maybe with his mind. You see some scriptures there, I think, on your screen that are the other two places where Thomas shares or where we hear what Thomas says. One is what I see is an act of bravery. Jesus is headed to Bethany. That's two miles from Jerusalem. He's already been threatened, and he says he's going to go to Bethany. And Thomas says, well, if you're going, we're going too. Let's go die with you, which to me, again, is a, maybe a bit pessimistic, but I think it demonstrates his loyalty to Jesus. And then we also see in that last night of Jesus' life, Jesus is preparing the disciples for his departure, and he says, you know, you, you guys are going to be where I am. And Thomas says, how, do we, how are we going to know how to get there? Which is a great question because Jesus hasn't told them at that point how to get there. So again, I think it's a practical nature of Thomas. I don't see him as doubting. Again, I see him as dedicated and loyal, but I also see him as practical as well. So what I want to pull from both of those, particularly for those of you who maybe aren't convinced this morning that Jesus is the Son of God and that he's the Savior of the world, or maybe you would say, well, he may, be, that, that he may work for other people. Other people may need him or other people may have some level of connection to him, but I don't, I don't really need that. He's not for me. I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you from Mary Magdalene and Thomas's story. What we see is Jesus showed up in each of their lives in a way that was most meaningful to them. And I think he'll do the same for you if you'll ask. So Mary Magdalene, again, that first morning, she's there, first on the scene. You imagine she probably didn't sleep the night before. She's just waiting for it to be legal for her to get to the tomb. As soon as the sun comes up, she's there. Uh, she's grief-stricken. Uh, that, that word crying is, is anguished, wailing. This isn't polite sniffling. She's making a scene there at the tomb. It's, it's something, it says something to me. She sees two angels, and they don't even register. She's, she's so intent 
on finding Jesus. She sees Jesus. He, she thinks he's the gardener. Maybe that's because he's out of place and he's unexpected, or maybe there's some supernatural thing going on and she can't see him. I don't know. But she says to him, and to me it's almost comical, just tell me where you put the body and I'll, I'll go get him. Jesus is a full-grown man, and his corpse would literally be dead weight. And I'm trying to picture Mary, like what does she think she's going to do? This is pre CrossFit, I don't know what she thinks she's going to do to him, how she's going to get him from wherever he is back to this tomb. But again, she's grief-stricken, and she's distraught, and she's beside herself. And then Jesus kind of breaks through all of that when he says her name, Mary, and she recognizes him. I don't know if you've ever been in a similar spot where you were beginning to get worked up, and someone that you know and you love, maybe they put their hands on your shoulders and they said your name. It kind of brings you back down, grounds you a little bit, brings you back into the moment. That's what Jesus does for Mary. He says her name, and that's all she needs. And then she's able to recognize him. Thomas is different. And Thomas, again, he's not wired like Mary, and Jesus appears to him in a way that I think is uh, unique to Thomas. I don't know why he wasn't there that first Easter night. You have the nine disciples uh, or excuse me, you have the 10 disciples are gathering. Judas is out of the mix. Thomas isn't there. I don't know. I don't know why they weren't under, you know, 10 people or less gathering restrictions. But he wasn't there. And uh, I, the disciples come to him and say, hey, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. He, he appeared to us. And Thomas's response, I don't, I don't know if you hear it as defiant. I don't. You know, I'm not going to believe unless I see the wounds and put my fingers in the nail holes and my hand in his side. And you could hear that, again, as him being defiant. I don't. I don't know if you've ever been left out. You've been left out of something. And it's kind of this natural response to say, well, I didn't really care anyway. I didn't really want to go anyway. Or that's stupid. Or, you know, we kind of can down. That's a normal response to being hurt that we were left out. And I'm wondering if that's where Thomas was coming from. He wasn't being defiant. He was just disappointed that for whatever reason, he wasn't there. I don't know if he was mad at the disciples. Maybe they didn't text him and let him know they were having a meeting. I don't know if he was kind of upset with Jesus. Like, how could you do that if I wasn't there? And I'm thinking he was most likely just upset with himself, that for whatever reason, he wasn't there that night. And so his response, when they say they've seen Jesus, and you can imagine how excited and overjoyed and exhilarated and bewildered. You can imagine all of the emotions, and he, he's left out. And again, I, I think just the human nature is to say, is to kind of react in that way to mask our disappointment and our hurt. Now, I, again, I think Thomas was being defiant because when Jesus shows up the next week and he gives Thomas the opportunity to run the experiment and do the test, Thomas doesn't do it. He doesn't put his fingers in Jesus' nail holes, and he doesn't put his hand in Jesus' side. I think what he wanted was the same experience that the other 10 disciples had. And you'll see there on the screen, it's, it's almost a carbon copy. What I, Jesus does almost the exact same thing one week later. And I think he does it just for Thomas. He knows that's what he needs. He knows that's what he needs. And so G Thomas gets the exact same experience. They're in a locked room and Jesus appears in the locked room and he says, peace be with you. And then he offers his wounds as an, an opportunity to verify that it's truly him. So in both cases, with Mary Magdalene and with Thomas, Jesus appears to them in a way that speaks to them, in a way that's meaningful to them. He doesn't just call Thomas's name. And for Mary Magdalene, he doesn't say, here, run the test. Put your fingers in my nail holes. He knows what they need, and that's what he gives them. And so my encouragement and my challenge if you're someone who's not yet convinced that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, would, would you ask? Would you take some time this week and would you ask him to reveal himself to you in a way that makes sense to you, in a way that you would understand? To me, the key is just to ask with sincerity. I think that's all Jesus is looking for. We, we know Mary was obviously sincere. She was incredibly earnest in her desire to find Jesus' body. But I see sincerity in Thomas as well, the fact that he shows up the next week. He doesn't pout. He doesn't uh, cut himself out of the mix. He shows back up the next Sunday night. Now, I don't know what he did the nights in between, but I know that Sunday night he was there. He put himself in the 
position to encounter the Lord. And Jesus showed up. And so again, I would encourage you, if you're someone who, who right now you would say, Jesus is not that to me. He's not my savior yet. Would you be willing to ask that question of him this week? Would you, Jesus, show yourself to me? Reveal yourself to me in a way that I can understand. If you truly are the son of God, if you truly are the savior of the world, if you really did rise from the dead on the first Easter 2,000 years ago, would you demonstrate that reality to me? If you're willing to do that, I'd encourage you just to let somebody know. Let someone know uh, that, that, that you love who's in a relationship with Jesus. And if you're not comfortable doing that, please reach out to one of us on the staff and let us know that you're praying that prayer. We're not going to try to convince you of anything that you don't want to believe. But we'll listen to you and we'll pray for you. And we'll just trust the Holy Spirit. His job is to lead us into the truth of who Jesus is. And we'll trust the Holy Spirit to do that in your life in the way, again, that's the most meaningful to you. Two other things, uh, and then we'll wrap up. I was looking at, thinking about Mary, and what do we learn from her, this resurrection appearance? It's interesting, Jesus, when he's talking to her, he says what? Go instead to my brothers and tell them this, I'm ascending to my father and to your father. So over 120 times in John's gospel, Jesus refers to God as his father. This is the first time Jesus refers to God as someone else's father. The resurrection changes the way that we interact with God. He goes from being Jesus' father to being our father as well. That may not seem like a big deal to you. That's kind of cliche for us. It's a massive shift. I read somewhere, I didn't go back and count, but I read somewhere there only 15 times in the Old Testament is God referred to as the father of Israel. 120 times in John's gospel alone, Jesus refers uh, to God as his father. And then here we see for the first time, we're included in that as well. And it's because of Jesus' resurrection that we can be sons and daughters of God. Katie mentioned that uh, when she was sharing a minute ago. Uh, Sin makes us, we're born enemies of God. In Jesus' death, he forgives us of our sins, and that makes us adoptable. I don't think that's a real word, but it's, it's one for us. Because of Jesus' resurrection, we know that the payment for our sin was accepted. The check was cashed. And that means that we can approach God without fear of rejection. We can be his children, and he can be our father. And all of that's made possible because of Jesus' death. And it's proved or demonstrated by his resurrection. Sorry, somebody just came in. It distracted me. Will you go? Thanks. Um, I'm back. So Jesus' resurrection demonstrates that he's our, that the payment for our sins has been made. And that we now can be sons and daughters of him. Uh, There's an interesting phrase in the Bible. It talks about Jesus as the cornerstone. And that word cornerstone can also be capstone. And when I think about God as our father, I think about it in both of those dynamics. The cornerstone is the first stone that's laid in a foundation. And all the other stones are aligned to it. The capstone is the last stone that's put into an arch or the last block put into an arch that holds the, the arch together. The idea of God as our father is both of those things in terms of our relationship with God. I asked you uh, about a week and a half ago in those Instagram devotionals, what do you think about when you think about God? And if you're not thinking about Father, if that's not what comes to your mind, God is my Father, I want to challenge you and I want to encourage you to press into that this week. I don't believe Jesus was the first Jew to ever call God Father, but what he did was he, he uh, centralized the father-child dynamic. He made that central, fundamental of, in terms of how we relate to God, our understanding of who God is and how we connect to him. Again, that idea of God as Father, it's the cornerstone for our relationship and every other understanding of God we have is aligned with that, God as Father. And it's the capstone, it's the thing that holds all of our understanding of who God is together. And that model prayer, Jesus said our Father. He didn't say our creator, he didn't say our sustainer, He didn't say our judge. He didn't say our provider. He's all of those things. But Jesus says, address him as father. And if that's not, if that doesn't naturally come out of you, 
if you don't tend to view God as your father, I challenge you and encourage you to press into that this week. A couple of things you can do. Read the story of the prodigal son. It's in Luke 15. To me, it's the best picture of what it means for God to be our father. Uh, you'll see a book there on the screen. It's called The Cross and the Prodigal. It's the best book I've ever read uh, on the prodigal son. It was written by a guy named Kenneth Bailey, who spent uh, most of his life in the Middle East. And so he's looking at this parable through the lens of a Middle Easterner. How would Jesus' original audience have heard it? It was revolutionary for me when I read it. I'd encourage you, if you don't want to read the book, uh, you can do the YouTube search there, the um, the keywords are on the screen, and you can watch his lectures. I think there's three or four where he walks through that parable in great depth. And if you don't want to do that, email Kim. There's a great article on Christianity Today. Unless you're a subscriber, you can't see it, but the church is a subscriber, and we can reprint it a thousand times. So rather than printing it, we'll send you the link, and you can read. It's an article from Kenneth Bailey where he's walking through this story, the prodigal son. And again, I, I want you to do this. Really important. It's one of the benefits of the resurrection that we can call God Father. And if you don't do that, again, if that doesn't naturally come out of you, if that's not how you view God, when you think about God, if you're not thinking he's my father, then you're missing a key dynamic that Jesus came to introduce us to. And and how much more so maybe even, even now in the midst of all of the chaos and all of the swirling, to know that you have a good father in heaven. And again, if that's not a core part of your understanding of who God is and how you're relating to him. I want to encourage you to press into that this week. Last thing, and then we're going to be done from Thomas. Stop doubting and believe. Literally, quit unbelieving and start believing. Quit unbelieving and start believing. Many of you have done that. I'm going to kind of jump off of this a little bit, not take it. I'm going to take it out of context, which is dangerous, but I'm going to do that here just as we close. Many of you have been believing that Jesus is your Savior, but you're not believing some other things about him. And it's difficult. Jesus says to Thomas, you know, you believed because you saw. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. And that's where many of us land. All of you have believed that Jesus is your Savior without seeing. He's not physically appeared to any of you. But there's some other areas where without seeing, it's become very difficult for you to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And again, maybe now more than ever, it's hard for you to believe that Jesus is your rock because you're feeling anxious and tossed around. It's hard for you to believe that Jesus is your provider because you're, you're fearful about your job security or the state of the economy. It's hard for you to believe that Jesus is your healer. You're scared about getting sick or someone you love getting sick and maybe you don't have a track record of Jesus healing people, and so you're nervous about that. I think about that uh, father who brought his son to Jesus. After he comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, his son is possessed by a demon. The disciples can't drive this demon out, and he goes to Jesus, and he says, help me if you can, and Jesus says, if, everything's possible. If you believe, and the guy says, I believe, help my unbelief. And that's where many of us, if we're honest, find ourselves. We believe some things about who Jesus is, but we don't believe everything. And that's not a rebuke. I think Jesus was not rebuking Thomas when he said, stop doubting and believe. I think he was inviting him deeper into relationship. Do you think Thomas's life was better the second week than the first week after he had begun to believe that Jesus was indeed risen from the dead? He had a better second week than the first week. Life believing is better than life doubting. And again, I don't hear that as rebuke. I hear that as invitation. Jesus inviting us to believe him at a deeper and at a greater level. We're going to close the service in kind of a unique way. We have a video. It's kind of a throwback. It's a video that we used to show on Easter. We haven't in several years. It's called That's My King. It's just a voice recording of an African-American preacher from the 1970s describing who Jesus is. I don't want you to turn this video off. I want you to watch it all the way through. I guarantee that everything he says is better than anything I've said. And it's going to be the best thing that you hear all week. As you're listening, I want you to listen prayerfully. I want you to listen through the lens of stop unbelieving and start believing. Or I believe, help my unbelief. Recognizing we all, there's growth for all of us. 
And as this pastor is describing all who, that Jesus is, all of the different ways in which he is the king, in which he is the Lord, I want you prayerfully just to begin to ask the Holy Spirit. You can go ahead and close your eyes. Just begin to ask the Holy Spirit, guide me more deeply into the truth of who Jesus is. These are the areas where I need help believing. These are the areas where I need help trusting. I need you to help me believe that you're my provider. I need you to help me believe that you're my healer. I need you to help me believe that you're my rock. I need you to help me believe that you're my deliverer. I need you to help me believe that you're sovereign over all of the chaos that's happening in this world right now. Recognize Jesus desires to invite you deeper into relationship. No matter how long you've walked with him, no matter how well you know him, there's always greater levels of depth and intimacy. And he would say to every one of us, not with words of condemnation, but with words of invitation. Stop doubting and believe. Quit unbelieving and start believing. If you're a skeptic, it's the same invitation. Stop doubting and start believing. Life is better in belief, in trust, in faith than it is in doubt. I'm gonna say a prayer and this video is gonna start and I want you to watch it all the way through and that's gonna be the way that we close. Holy Spirit, I pray for every child and every student and every adult who's watching this that you would guide each one of us more deeply into the truth of who Jesus is. I'm so thankful that you know us so well, you personalize the invitation. And I pray for each one of us that we would hear you calling to us. Again, those who who would say right now they they don't know you, maybe they're skeptical that you've you've been raised from the dead, that they, from whatever level of sincerity they have, they would say, reveal yourself to me as my Savior. For those who've been walking with you for years, they would say, Holy Spirit, would you reveal Jesus to me as my healer, as my rock, as my provider, whatever it is that we need? Would you not just today, but over the course of the rest of this week, would you be leading us more deeply into the reality of who Jesus is? And I also want to pray specifically for any who wrestle with this idea that you're their father. I pray there be grace to forgive earthly fathers. We all come up short. And I pray, God, that there would be revelation. For God the Father so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever stops doubting and starts believing in him can live forever as a son or a daughter of God. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented.
represented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his matchless, his goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him, for yet he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. 